sponsored by Taylor Freelance, Rainier Ballistics, Hodgson Powders, and JPL Precision. Everybody, welcome back to Power Factor. Uh, I thought I'd take a few minutes here and answer some more uh, viewer email questions. Uh, so the first one is by Bill B. And it says, shooting vest versus pouch, what are your preferences? Uh, that's a good question, Bill. I started out for many, I'd say a good year, a couple years or whatever, just using a, a shooting pouch um, for most of all of my shooting. Um, and most of all of my shooting primarily consisted back early on of just trap shooting. So this is the type of shooting pouch that I would use. Uh, very basic, simple. I think it, it holds about 50 or so holes uh, and then you can take all your empties and throw them on the other side so you're not dumping them on the ground. Um, now it's interesting also, I'm not sure exactly why, but one, I'm not gonna call it a pet peeve, but one observation is a lot of shotgun shooters just simply dump their holes on the ground and expect somebody else to pick them up, or sometimes they'll actually pick them up themselves, but it's almost like they can't be bothered while they're shooting of actually storing their holes somewhere so they can easily discard it later. But at any rate, um, so this is what I, I primarily use for quite some time. Um, and even when I started shooting skeet or started shooting uh, sporting clays, I was using this. But I thought, well, you know, I, I kind of, to a certain degree, always resisted getting a vest because um, I just, I don't know, kind of seemed like a piece of clothing that wasn't really necessary. But for whatever reason, and I don't know why, I finally um, bit the bullet and decided to go out and get a, a shooting vest. And it actually, I'm really glad I did because there's a lot of features in the vest that, that are nice and beneficial. So this is my shooting vest that I've used. Um, you've seen this before in the past uh, on some of the episodes that we've done. But primarily um, they have a, an inside inside pockets for sticking uh, different various things. Um, you know, ear protection if you're using plugs uh, or maybe shooting glasses or, or things of that nature. Um, but externally They'll have a pouch or some place usually to put maybe a couple chokes or something like that. Uh, they usually have a kind of like a leather suede patch here to make or facilitate gun mounting um, more consistent and, and easier uh, so it doesn't snag in your clothes. Um, and you'll also see that a lot of them have four pouches on the front of the vest. And there's a reason for that. Um, a lot of times, not so much in skeet and definitely not in trap, but if you're shooting sporting clays, the different presentations that you're running into may require different uh, shot or, or, or size of shot. So what, what I mean by that is that, as an example, um, your traditional clay target, you know, you can usually hit depending on distance or whatever, um, you know, with number eights or number seven and a half, but sometimes Depending on distance, if it's a close target, somebody may want to use eights or nines. Um, if it's a distance target, they may want to use seven and a halves. Depending on the type of target, they may want to change the particular um, load that they're throwing. So like this is a, this is a Batu target. These are, are really thin. It doesn't take much to hit them. Um, sometimes depending on distance or whatever, guys will throw nines at these um, or eight and a halves. Uh, so, you know, that, that's one instance where somebody might, may want to change their, their selected shell. Um, this is a MIDI, uh, pretty, you know, smaller than a standard size target. Might actually suggest that it might be a little more resistant to breaking than a normal size target. Um, you'll see these things, and the only reason I say that is that when I've seen these things thrown out in the field where they're completely missed, often a normal target will break when it hits the ground. A lot of times these things will not break. Um, so you may want to go to a little heavier shot for something like this. And then finally, a rabbit target. Um, these things are really solid. Uh, you probably can't really see on here on camera, but the width of this target and the rim uh, is probably a good 3 eighths of an inch. The center of the target, I'm guessing, is probably about 3 sixteenths, give or take. It's a pretty durable little target um, because of the fact that it's thrown along the ground. It needs to be able to not break when it hits the ground, hence the heavier rim on it. Um, but these, you know, you may want to change your, your selected uh, shot shell load for running into one of these. Usually these are thrown pretty close, um, but it does take a little bit of energy to, to a few pellets to break one of these things. So that's primarily the reason why you're going to see the, the four 
uh, our uh, pouches on a on a shooting vest. Um, so my vest, this is my vest, um, is basically a solid, has no mesh or anything like that, does not have any place to stick spare holes or empties or anything of that nature. So what I do is I use a basically a, a mesh bag um, to put my spare or fired holes into, drop them in there, this holds about 100 or so. And then when I'm done, there's a nice little zipper here in the bottom, which opens up, and then you can dump all the holes out into your bag for collecting. So whether I'm using a, a vest or whether I'm using a, the pouch, I typically always use this just so I'm separating my, um, my live rounds from my fired rounds. Um, another take on the vest, is this one. This is actually my wife's vest, her shooting vest. Um, again, you'll note here four pouches on it, uh, like just like mine. Um, has a place for spare chokes. Of course, it's night, nice bright blue teal colored. Um, it's a full mesh vest here. Um, my wife, I'm gonna say, is a fair weather shooter, so she's usually, or definitely, I'm not even gonna say usually, she is not shooting in the winter. Uh, she's usually just shooting either in spring or summer when it's it's nice and warm. One of the other nice features of this is that I would say she's a somewhat recoil sensitive. So in all these vests that you'll find, there will be a, a pouch in them to stick in a recoil shield. So she has a recoil shield that she, that she has in her, her particular vest uh, to mitigate um, some of the recoil that uh, you experience while shooting. And women especially um, like you know, that, that feature to try to buffer some of the recoil. Um, so at any rate, there's a lot of different vest options out there. Um, one recommendation when it comes to getting a vest is to get one that fits a little bit snug. You don't want a loose floppy vest or anything like that because that's just more places for the gun to snag or hang up on. Um, so, so keep that in mind when shopping for vests. And there's a lot of different vests out there. This one's a Browning. Um, mine is a Beretta. Uh, there's another company called Shoot the Moon. Um, they make some nice vests that are somewhat rather pricey. You can go to Cabela's and find vests there. You're going to find typically for a well-made vest, uh, it's going to run anywhere from, I'm going to say, maybe $70 up. Um, but most, most of your, your traditional vests are probably going to be in the $70 to $120 range. But there are some out there that are very, very expensive. Um, other options are there are shooting jackets and things of that nature for, for, you know, shooting in the winter. And that's one point that I'll make here is that I use a shooting vest pretty much, uh, when the temperature is, I'm going to say between 50 and 90 degrees. Um, if it's below 50, I'm going to be wearing a heavy jacket, uh, and at which point the vest just adds additional bulk. And again, that's going to add length to pull. So when it's, again, below 50, I'm going to say below 45. When it's below 45, I'm going to be wearing my heavy winter jacket. And in that case, I'm going to be using um, the shooting pouch. Uh, and then conversely, when it gets above 90, it's just so darn hot out um, that I don't want to be you know, wearing anything like that, even a mesh vest. Um, and you'll notice a lot of guys will go to, they'll make like half vests. John has one of these half vests where you can unzipper the bottom part and you just have the, the different uh, places to put your, your shotgun shells. Um, so when it gets to be above um, 90 degrees or so, I'm going to go back to my pouch again, um, just from a minimalist standpoint. Um, so those are the, pretty much the two extremes for me. If it's, if it's really hot or really cold, I'm going to be using a pouch. If it's anything in between, I'm going to be using a vest. Um, so go out and check out the different vests that are out there. I think you know that if you are seriously into shotgun shooting, that you will um, find they can be helpful, especially from the standpoint of if you shoot low gun. Um, uh, the whole entire mount, you're not snagging the vest or anything like that. Um, if you're shooting pre-mounted, um, not so much of a benefit there, but it's just nice to have all your shells and anything that you may need all in one place and you don't have to go back and carry a shooting bag or go back, you know, stepping off the stand to go get something or whatever. It's there, of course, and when you're shooting trap or skeet, you're not changing chokes. You definitely may be doing that in sporting clay scenario. Um, so basically, yeah, I, I definitely, um, after having some resistance to going out and getting a vest, and it was really personal resistance, I was just thinking, you know, I, I've given Rick a hard time before about his IDPA shooting vest. In fact, if you remember one of the very early episodes, 
um, that we did, I, I kind of took a light, light humored stab at it by wearing my fishing vest um, and suggesting that was my new IDPA shooting vest. So uh, I'm surprised actually Rick didn't give me grief about my, uh, my using a vest for shotgun shooting, but Rick's a nice guy, so there you go. Um, speaking of Rick, uh, I noticed in one of his last uh, episodes that he did, he was wearing his, his mini hat, so I thought I'd, I'd wear my BMW hat. Maybe Rick is starting a tradition here where we'll all start wearing our, uh, our car hats uh, for filming episodes. Um, so the next question we have here is from Alex D. And he says, I've noticed you wear gloves when shooting. Why is that? Is it because your hands are cold? Well, initially it did start out that way. Um, during the winter, when we would be out shooting, um, and probably I think one of the very first episodes that we did in that scenario was a Sporting Clays episode. And it was rainy and miserable that day. I think that was shot in January or February. And I was wearing shooting gloves, um, primarily to keep my hands warm. Um, and I found actually one of the benefits of shooting gloves is really actually three or four things. Um, one, yeah, it keeps your hands warm. Uh, two, if you sweat, um, and a lot of people have sweat that can then cause, you know, adverse uh, rust or, or corrosion on their firearms. Uh, I'm not one of those, but there are people I've heard of who have done that or, or do have that issue or whatever. So if you sweat and it's warm and you get sweat in the gun, um, it may cause corrosion. The gloves will resist that. Um, from the standpoint of, of getting just a better grip on the gun, uh, I feel that the gloves provide a more consistent grip. Um, and finally, um, from the standpoint of, of just um, of comfort and also keeping your hands clean, uh, you know, I pick up empty holes or whatever while I'm out shooting. Um, not mine, someone else's usually, um, that I want to say for whatever reason. And I've noticed that after shooting with gloves on, your hands are clean at the end of the day. They don't have, you know, filth or dirt or anything like that on them. So in terms of gloves, I thought I'd show you actually what I use. Um, and, and, I, and the different shotgun forums, or at least the one shotgun world that John and I frequent, and also trap shooters, um, by far the, one, the gloves that people recommend are actually golfing gloves um, by a company called FootJoy. So these are the FootJoy winter golfing gloves. And the nice thing normally, like when you look at golfing gloves, you get one. Um, and I don't golf, so I don't know if it's your right hand or your left hand, but whatever, you get one. Um, the nice thing with the winter gloves is you get two. And these are made out of um, uh, polar fleece, apparently. And they kind of have, well, I wouldn't really say it's a suede grip on it, but it's something simulated here or synthetic or whatever that gives you a, a nice grip on the club or in this case on the gun. So these are really nice. They work well um, when it gets really cold out. Uh, and I, I definitely appreciate that. So I'll wear these gloves usually for anything below, let's say 40 degrees. Um, so if it's 40 degrees and down, I'm going to be wearing um, these particular gloves. So foot joy, um, golfing or winter, I'm sorry, winter golfing gloves. And then after finding out how much I like wearing gloves during the winter and they, again, the benefits that I mentioned um, previously, I decided to start using um, gloves during summer shooting. So these are the FootJoy uh, rain gloves and they are really thin, um, but again, they kind of have this, this simulated sort of suede uh, palm on both of them. And again, the nice thing is there's actually two of them that come to a package as opposed to one. So for golfing, apparently these work really well in the rain, um, but in shooting, they work really well in the dry or when it's really hot. And I will wear gloves even if it's blazing hot out, if it, even if it's 90 degrees out. Uh, and it gets really hot and I switch to, you know, the pouch like I was suggesting before, not wearing a vest. I will wear gloves, again, from the standpoint of it's giving me a more consistent grip. If it's hot and it's sweaty, uh, I'm not transferring that to the gun. Um, my hands are clean at the end of the day. Obviously, warmth is not an issue in the summer. Um, and again, these are the, the Foot Joy uh, rain glove. And, you know, you can go out and, and buy really expensive gloves. There's, you know, our, uh, Breta makes shooting gloves for about 40 bucks or so. And there's a lot of other high-end companies that are making gloves. These things are dirt cheap. Um, 
normal price on these, I think, and I, I get mine at, at um, Sports Authority. So a normal price on these is about maybe twenty dollars for a pair. Um, my I just my my winter gloves um, that I got this year were on sale for like thirteen dollars, which I thought was a heck of a good deal. Um, so yeah, they're they're cheap and they do last. They're not something like you'll get them and they'll you know fall apart on you. Um, most of my gloves usually last about two years or so. These are brand new this year because I wore out my other ones. Um, these, my summer gloves, these got to be about two years old. Um, I've been using these now for about two years and they're still doing very well and no signs of holes or tears or anything like that. So if you're looking, if you're if a type of person who likes to shoot with gloves, um, I definitely go out and recommend getting the FootJoy gloves. Um, they're cheap, they work, um, and you can find them at Sports Authority. So the last thing I kind of mentioned here is completely unrelated to all this. Um, I had an actually interesting conversation with somebody at the range here recently. We were discussing shotgun presses and I had mentioned to him that I had the Dillon SL900 uh, and how much I liked it. And he went away and came back the next week and he said, you know, this is kind of funny. I went out and did uh, a little bit of research in the Dillon SL900 and guess what I came across? your video and it's like i thought well that's interesting so he went and watched the first video and i said yeah you really should watch both videos because the second video i kind of detailed some of the the issues if you want to call it that that i ran into with the press and i bumped him to him again at the range yesterday and he said i watched the second video and after watching that i'm i'm very afraid to go out and buy that press just because of the issues that i had with it and and you know i hope that video wasn't taken negatively as as a, like a bitch session or anything like that about problems that I'm having the press and implying that I didn't like it because obviously I do like it. I still have it and I wouldn't trade it for anything. Um, so yes, you know, there, there were some startup issues with the press. Um, there were some changes that I needed to make, primarily the primer system uh, that we talked before about in the past with the washer that I ended up installing. Now, the funny thing is with that is that um, that washer modification, I guess, is now somewhat widely known across the internet, and people keep referring back to the episode that I did. So one of the guys that actually said that he had to do it, I contacted him, and I said, when did you roughly get your press? Because I was curious if he may have gotten his about the same time frame that I got mine. And sure enough, he did. Um, I've talked to other people who have not had that issue, so I'm beginning to wonder if it may have just been a, a I'm going to call it a limited or narrow production issue that Dylan had at that particular time and that's where it applies. So um, I'd be curious to hear from somebody who may have, have purchased a press later and found they had to do this also. Um, but for the most part, it sounds like people have not had uh, some of the issues that I did. So again, um, I'm, I'm really happy with the press. I would not trade it for anything. Um, all presses are gonna have their little quirks that everything that you need to learn about on them. Uh, but you know, once you get um, some time on the press and abused it for a while, you discover these, you, you under, or learn to understand them and how to work around them. Um, but I, I definitely, even to this day, still you know, recommend the SL900. I've talked to quite a few people who have contacted us about um, asking for you know, input or help on it or whatever, and have tried to provide that. Um, but most of the issues that I have heard of with the Dylan um, are, are directly you know, addressable to usually due to one uh, minor adjustment with the exception of one guy who had an issue where it sounded like there was a major problem with the design of the shell plate. And he ended up sending it back to Dylan. Um, and and it, they didn't, I, 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 don't, I, I don't recall if he mentioned if they said what they replaced or not. But uh, he got it back from then, it was working perfectly. And the only thing that I could guess that was causing his problem would have been a defective shell plate. So, um, so there you go. So if you, if you have an SL900 and you're experiencing problems, or especially that primer issue that I mentioned about where I had to do the, the washer modification, I'd be interested in hearing from you. Um, if you have a SL900 and you haven't had that problem and it's a recent manufacturer, I'm, I'd be interested in hearing from you. So either way, I'd, I'm kind of curious on what people will run into with that. But yes, I am very happy with the press. And if I was not happy with the press, I would have dumped it and, um, and gotten something else. So there you go. So, so I hope that doesn't come across as a, as a, uh, as, as a negative video on the SL900. Um, I do endorse the press. I do like it. So. Uh, if you have any questions, contact us, uh, usual deal at powerfactorshow at gmail.com or on Facebook. Uh, other than that, next time we'll see you again and break them all.